Welcome back everybody. I think we'll get started on the second part of today's lecture. So in the first half we had a pit stop tour of his life and how certain ideas emerged. Now, now I think in the second part when we actually talk about those concepts and theories in depth, all of those uh, ideas that we originally uh, discussed in the beginning and is emerged from his life all kind of like fall into place and, and, and cohere ideally. But again, it's worth emphasizing that, you know, this uh, um, exposition of his, of his theory, the purposes of that is primarily so that we can go on to discuss his uh, psychology of religion and then um, refutations of it and see what, how the language, which we might have got begun to notice has, has, has filtered through uh, a common conversation as well. And just while we were on the break, I, I remembered the, the interesting story about uh, the, the 11th century uh, Islamic mystic Imam Ghazali wrote a famous refutation of the Ibn Sina as a philosophy, Ibn Sina not Farabi, their philosophy in his book, uh, The Haftar Philosopher. And people don't, a lot of people don't know is that actually he wrote that following another book called uh, The Maqasid al Philosopher and the purposes, the aims of the philosophers, which he actually um, very aptly. And appropriately summarized and synthesized all the beliefs of, of, of the followers of Ibn Sina and al Farabi, and then wrote the refutation years later. But when the uh, the Latin translation movement took place to translate it from Arabic to Latin, uh, the only work that they translated was the aims of the philosophers and not the refutation. So for the, the longest time, Imam Ghazali was viewed as a as an Avicenna propagator. In, in the West because of that book and how well they presented the ideas of the Nassim al So I, I, I want to make it clear that while this while this lecture in itself can possibly be a standalone uh, lecture on the history of, of the biography and the ideas of, of Sigmund Freud, uh, the purposes of this is broadly within uh, uh, the, the, the project of talking about psychology of religion and, and, and presenting uh, the, the counter evidence and the refutations of some of his ideas in, in the next lecture. Uh, the key concepts, so while we discussed uh, briefly did an overview of this at the beginning of the, of the lecture and the ideas began emanating and emerging from his biography, we'll now look at how those events and how his own introspection and clinical experience um, and conflicts with other thinkers during the time, particularly Jung, um, and how the events, World War One, of course, uh, then in, from that emerged a theory and concepts um, that then kind of became like the doctrinal stone stone thing that then began to be applied not just by Freud himself but by psychoanalysts since, and and then these doctrines and then ideas then became the things that people then. Um, um, either rebelled against or developed into the future. So Anna Freud, Freud's daughter, started a school called Ego Psychology where her, psych where her focus was primarily on developing the ego, uh, developing the concept of the ego and, and what defense mechanisms it uses to, to, uh, um, to counter the, the unconscious. Um, other schools, um, and most prominently in the UK, the Kleinian school, which is based on, based on Melon Klein, um, she downplayed the role of sex, but it was more like, you know, the, the libido is less about um, achieving uh, sexual intercourse or, or gratification of, of the sex drive, but rather it's more, the human beings more have a drive for how they relate to objects or people. So, you know, divergences, but all on the key concepts that emerged from Freud. So what we'll do right now is now to have much more of a, quite got a theoretical uh, uh, discussion about what the main ideas were. And then, and then I like which ones actually will uh, be, be applied by Freud in, in, when we talk about his psychology of religion in a couple of weeks. Um, so key concept of psychoanalysis, number one is psychological determinism. So Freud very much being a materialist and um, in his early years before that period of self-analysis, he set himself uh, what he called his project for a scientific psychology and he really was drawing on from ideas uh, by, by Newton and Darwin and then other philosophical ideas of his time to form uh, uh, um, um, uh, make a natural science of psychology 
and through those ideas and those like you know it was looking for cause and effect principles and uh, even these ideas of energy so even the, when, you, when you talk about the libido and we'll talk about, about that in a moment you'll talk about that like that is a physical energy as if you talk about you know light or, <clears throat> or heat or something you know it, it has to be transferred you can't destroy or create it, it can only be transferred in different domains um but through that approach then comes the idea of cause and effect so no thought no symptom no action is without a deeper psychological cause and in the neurosis neurosis the term being used for a mental condition in which the origins is psychological anything observed in a patient has a cause and by unlocking that cause or bringing that cause to light because they believe that those cause which would largely be unconscious that would be sexual in nature and repressed within the unconscious so his primarily his primary cause in that cause and effect nexus was repressed sexual urges so that's what you meant by psychological determinism or thought and neuroses and motivation and then expression comes from primarily a sexual cause primarily unconscious so no mental happening for him is that accidental uh, in, in the process of his analyzing people, even the most minute detail, the most minute slip of the tongue, the most random joke in the process of free association, the most random word can then become a focal point of analysis because it, nothing is futile or superfluous. So when he was analyzing those hysterical symptoms, uh, like in, in his own patients, for example, of Breuer and Anna O, um, all, all the historical uh, hysterical sorry, hysterical symptoms had a logical continuity uh, from emanating from individual desires and memories. So, for instance, like Anna o, in that case of Breuer in 1881, uh, she had among other symptoms an aversion for water. So seemingly very bizarre, random um, symptom, but then the the, the memory. That Joseph Breuer unlocked in that first very first instance of that of, of that talking therapy was that Anna O oh, as a child she'd seen a dog drink from a glass of water and was horrified by that and then that memory repressed and never recalled again resulted further and later on in life in her aversion for drinking water and then once Breuer again you can recognize that this this is a and a sexual uh, theme around this, just because Breuer was being surprised for Freud's own uh, intervention in that. Um, once that memory was brought to light, and I then had a very you know, elaborate cathartic response, and then that aversion went away. So you can see that logical continuity between the cause and effect and that thing. That is central to psychoanalysis and finding through various methods, uh, th again, dream analysis, um, through association and digging in uh, deeper to, to find the cause of uh, the effect of the symptom or normative or abnormal human behavior. And during that time when Freud was kind of developing these ideas, archaeology was a big deal. And Freud actually recounted that he read more books on archaeology than, than he did in psychology. And he himself viewed himself as an archaeologist and you know, going into the depths of the unconscious and finding the source and finding the cause of any given uh, symptom uh, in his patient. And um, yeah, so that, that causes of that stress would be uncovered um, but with the, pro the procedure of psychoanalysis and everything from repetitions and random slip of the tongue, dreams and everyday mistakes, which we've discussed. So number two, and I think central and perhaps the most uh, important um, concept, not just within Freudian psychoanalysis, but again, as I said, any umbrella uh, understanding of depth psychology and all the other schools that came after was the concept of the unconscious. Now, as the quote says on the quote, says on the bottom, which comes from Freud, is that the poets and philosophers before me discovered the unconscious. What I discovered was the scientific method by which the unconscious can be studied. So the idea of the unconscious had been floating around a lot that during that period again last week i mentioned that schopenhauer's idea of the will 
it has kind of like this undifferentiated force that drives all human behavior and that's very akin to the unconscious. Uh, William James, who we'll discuss in a few weeks, you know, there's like the subconscious and how that affects uh, uh, human perception and thought. Um, and within poetry, fairly common uh, to discuss the unconscious as well. But that kind of unconscious, perhaps not in the Schopenhauerian type, but it can be viewed as this kind of like, you know, again, a repository space, which is still, nothing occurs. There. It's just a waste bin where forgotten memories go or um, thought processes, or which, which you don't need to access. They're all in this box where nothing happens called the unconscious and all, everything that's happening is in this thing called consciousness. That would be the previous perception before Freud. What Freud did was that he developed an understanding of the dynamic unconscious, right? So it's not this still space where nothing is happening. And I'll read off that line on the top is that the repressed contents which have been denied access to the pre-conscious conscious system by the operation of repression. So think there is a lot of repressed content within this space called the unconscious which are striving for expression into consciousness and this unconscious will as i begin to unpack further concepts that emerge we'll find out what are those drives that are that are warring within this space called the unconscious to achieve uh, expression and from discussing the biography so far, perhaps you know, no point for, for for guessing what 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 that force is, but uh, we will we'll unpack that further. But the idea of the unconscious, central to Freudian thought, central then to Jungian thought, and all the other schools that emerged afterwards, and the dynamic unconscious, particularly. Yeah. Number two, sexuality. Um, as we began uh, going through his life, uh, I thought. It, I think it abundantly became clear after his self-analysis and his theoretical developments that he viewed sex, sexuality, and the libido as a core explanatory concept of all human behavior. Um, it is worthwhile elaborating what he means by sex and what he means by libido. It's not simply um, the drive to achieve sexual intercourse, while that is a big part, obviously. Freud defined the libido as anything that gave people pleasure. And not just any pleasure, I mean, of course, it's directly sexual pleasure, but that doesn't necessarily mean, again, sexual intercourse, it can be through like voyeurism, or, you know, fantasy. So, but that drive is the fundamental human drive, and that's how he defines the libido. So, it's a sexual energy and the sexual drive at the source of human behavior and unconscious conflict. So, part of that and conflict, not part, but a huge part of the conflicts happening within uh, that area of the unconscious is the sex drive trying to manifest itself into the consciousness. But various factors, as we'll begin to talk about later, um, are keeping that expression of that sexuality repressed. And as we began talking about, to give that example of Freud, it's not just norm, what you call normative sexual desire. Again, Freud had claimed he had immense sexual desire for his mother, and then he would say that you know, that drive is being um, suppressed into his unconscious because that kind of uh, uh, because of you know fear of being uh, persecuted by his father or societal, moral, religious norms, and so, and so forth. Um, but of course, very shocking at the time, still very shocking. And it was the main source of dissent for uh, people who worked with him. So also Joseph Breuer, uh, when Freud really wanted to drill this point down that none of the hysteria is at the source of it is sex. And Charcot uh, mentioned to Freud, uh, he broke off, Breuer broke off from Freud. Uh, Jung, for the same reason, Adler, for the same reason, object relations is that school. Melanie Klein, as I said, there, uh, there were the huge debates between her and Anna Freud after Freud's death. Um, her emphasis was on you know, relationships rather than uh, the model set up, up, set up by Freud. So sexuality as the key and explanatory principle. Um, and then the drive. So with the, the sex drive, Eros uh, is what he called it. And then humans or behavior 
is driven by internal, mostly unconscious forces. And the psychologists to trace how these desire drives are expressed and satisfied. So within the unconscious, as I said, it's the sex drive that's raging. And that was the primar primary um, explanatory principle he had for until 1920, when he introduced the death drive. So following World War I, uh, and the tragedies that occurred as a process, he introduced, he introduced that you know, human beings have another central drive, which is that conflict with you know, with the sex drive. So sex drive would be to, you know, part of it would be the process of creation, uh, but the, the death drive, on the other hand, it's not it's the inverse, the drive for destruction and aggression. And uh, these drives, perhaps that conflict, but both are trying to merge from the unconscious and gain a conscious uh, manifestation. And then the, the sex drive and the death drive can work in various ways as well. So you can talk about say the masochism and how that, that's an, you know, an integration of sex drive and the death drive both trying to emerge. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the primary drive theory. And this is perhaps the, gonna be the more um, interesting perhaps part of the, of the discussion would be his developmental theory. Um, so after his self-analysis uh, from 1902 to 1910, I said he, uh, he understood within himself from his own analysis that that desire towards his mother, which came very, very early in life, was a central part of his sense of self and his understanding of himself to his mother and his own relations and his, his relation to his father. He then, in that period, developed a developmental theory in which a central concept of that theory was that infants from a very young age, from the age of one, uh, even the later developed sort of place that even earlier than that, in a very few months, would be invested completely with the sex drive and libido. And that libido, from a very young age, gets directed to different parts of the child's body. And depending on where it's directed to and how the infant and the young child moves through that direction, the libido to that part of the body will determine who the child is fundamentally later on in life. So I'll just read the top part. Freud's theory assumed that the sexual drive operated from birth but was expressed in different ways during the course of development. He suggested these what he suggested these ways could be coded according to the pleasure sites of the body, oral, anal, phallic, and genital. So he stated that again, bringing on that theory of the conservation of energy, was that the libido is a force that can't be destroyed or created. It can be redirected to certain parts of the body. And he presented this as a theory of a child's sexual development and child's development of their personality by where that libido is directed. So Freud said that the first part of the child's body where the libido is directed is to the mouth, so or Because as a child, again, I just want to emphasize that, that, that Freud by necessarily by, 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 by libido, and he, he, he means pleasure in the broadest sense of the word here. Uh, this is not necessarily sexual pleasure, um, but the first orifice of, of the, the child receives pleasures oral through feeding, uh, the breastfeeding of the mother, that's, that's where he primarily receives pleasure. And the major conflict that can occur at this stage in the first couple of years of the child's life is in the weaning process where the child is then turned to food and how easily the child is able to uh, move on from the mother's breast and, and towards the food, and how well the, the child is able to adapt to that weaning process then has a huge impact on the child's life. So then someone who's stuck in that process or unable to do it well is, as you might have heard the term, orally fixated, and that individual might seek pleasure, constantly try to seek pleasure from that mode of oral gratification, whether that's the eating, drinking, biting their tongue, smoking, and so on and so forth. Um, but first couple of years of life, Freud was saying that the, the libido is directed towards the mouth. 
he then says that the, 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 the next stage of it, the libido, is directed to anus. So this is the period that would now be called potty training, essentially, where the, where the child is taught uh, how to manage uh, urination and, and defecation. And depending on how strict or how lenient um, the, the process of, 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 of this potty training or toilet training is, uh, will determine the child's personality later on as well. So if it's too liberal, as in too, uh, the parents don't really care about it, the, the child will be, you know, neglectful of their hygiene, destructive, and, you know, so and so forth. But if they're too uh, strict, uh, the child, as a form of rebellion, will become what's called anally retentive, and that specifically means, you know, someone who's very stingy and controlling and very specific about uh, hygiene and so and so forth. Uh, so, again, but then Freud's also saying that the child gains a lot of pleasure from that process of retention or expulsion during that period, so the libido is directed to this orifice. Now, Freud says that this occurs up to, say, the, the third year in life. And here the child is beginning to understand language as well and trying to process the specific orders it's getting about that training and, and you know, building a sense of connection between language and, and uh, their own sense of pleasure, which wasn't there in the previous phase, the oral phase. Now the next phase is the more interesting one. Um, so he, up till the oral and the anal phase, this occurs both in, in boys and girls. Again, these ideas should sound shocking. Again, he's making very specific points about uh, young children's sexuality. Uh, here, in the next phase, the third phase, which he calls the phallic phase, is the stage in, uh, he, I think he places it around uh, the ages of four or five, perhaps up to the age of six, where a child becomes acutely aware of the specific genitalia that they have. So a young boy would become aware that he has a penis, and then that the, the, the phallus then becomes the the libido then gets transferred to the phallus and the child then the male child would then develop what's called the Oedipus complex he would uh, feel in, intense sexual desire to possess uh, the mother and as a result he would feel persecuted by the father because the father is you know, is in competition with him to uh, uh, to acquire, or is the barrier or the hurdle between him and the mother. So he possesses intense, um, deathly aggressive wishes to as a father to destroy him. But then the child also becomes familiar with the fact, supposedly, again, all Freudian theory, this isn't, this isn't scripture. He becomes aware of the fact that other human beings do not have penises in the, in the instances of girls. So he assumes the child male to Freud assumes that the, the female has been castrated. So then he develops this intense castration anxiety that as a result of being hostile or the competition towards the father, the father will castrate the child. So then Freud says that then he, the child to deal with that, then begins to identify with the father. If he can't beat them, join them, and then incorporates the father into his psyche, the father's morals and so on and so forth as a way of resolving that unconscious sexual impulse towards the mother. That's the Oedipal complex in, in, a, in a nutshell. So, so the Oedipus complex, he got that from the, the play by Sophocles, the Oedipus Rex, where uh, uh, the, the, the gist of the story is that the, the main character, uh, Oedipus is a uh, son of the king in Thebes, and it's prophesized that, that you know, when the child will grow up, he'll have sex with his mother and murder the father and become king. So the father then just, you know, the king leaves him to die on a mountain. He gets picked up and then raised. And so as Oedipus grows up, he then goes to Thebes. Uh, and then on the way, he meets a man who he doesn't recognize, but they get into a fight and then he kills the man. He ends up being his father. And then as he tries to enter Thebes, there's a sphinx. By the way, Oedipus has no idea who he really is at this point. Um, the sphinx asks some riddles. He answers the riddle. Uh, answers to two riddles apparently, and uh, the, the Sphinx is basically the guard of the anyone trying to enter uh, 
Thebes, the city, uh, has to answer the riddles, which are usually dark, the, 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 the Sphinx would end up eating the person. So uh, Oedipus answers the riddles, and then the Sphinx commits, uh, kills itself. And then as a reward, he gets to marry the queen, who's just been widowed because her husband's been murdered on the road, unbeknownst to uh, Oedipus. Then he marries his mother, has two daughters, and then it becomes clear what has happened. The mother commits suicide and... Uh, Oedipus gouges his eyes out, expects the desire to possess the mother sexually and just kill the father. That's the Oedipus complex of the male. He had a parallel theory about what, what happens in, in young girls. So he, he, he um, girls, no. Process follow on the final phase, realize that they don't have. And the, the, the phallus, the penis, the penis envy. And it was the mother. Originally, they did feel desire towards the mother. Again, on the body theory. And then they feel intense sexual desire towards the father. That the father would then be able to impregnate them by, as, as a sort of a, uh, as a, as a, as a return for the castration, basically, as as a, as, as you know, the Greek for it is a, the words not coming to me, but they can get what it is. Um, as a result of castration, what they can give in return essentially is a child uh, through impregnation. And then again, this is Freud is saying that all this happens in the first four or five years of the, of the, of the girl's life. Eventually, the girl realizes that the father will not be able to do that. Then she begins to redirect her uh, libido and sexual impulse to, to other men. Interesting. Um, so th that complex, the Oedipus complex, and then the, the penis envy occurs again, Freudian theory, according in the first few, in the first four to six years in life. Whether or not that is resolved for Freud, that's the crux of, of uh, human personality development and heterosexual development. Then he says that during this, it's in this phase that then the child develops specific heterosexual desire. Um, once that is resolved or not resolved, there's a latent phase that he argues that occurs from the age of five all the way up to puberty, and then puberty occurs and that results in you know, normative uh, sexual development, he called that the genital phase. So, um, yeah, that in a nutshell is specifically Freud's, very, uh, Freud's theory about human development, human personality, and how he, and human nature, fundamentally. And the Oedipus complex is right at the middle of, of the entire uh, development and conflict. And it is this, th this theory that, that in, then he applies to the understanding of religion very bizarrely. So the reason why I went into all that detail was that this part of the theory needs to be understood to understand how he applied it to religion. Um, and, and that you understand what's at the core of the Freudian psychoanalytic psychotherapy as well, and theory. So, Second line, uh, central feature of human psychosexual development is the way in which he termed, what he termed the Oedipus complex is negotiated. That is how infants manage the restriction placed on their sexuality by society and especially by their parents. So again, the, the, the conflict that the child feels, that the, far, the boy feels that the father might persecute him or castrate him because of his desire towards his mother. Um, so that's uh, Freud's developmental theory. Um, then he developed his what's called the metapsychology, the structure of the psyche. So, again, bringing up the idea that he believed in the conflict theory of the mind. So the mind is constantly disturbed by conflict. So, like you know, the child's, the boy's desire to possess the mother, but it's in conflict with the reality of the fact, not reality, but you know, the child's perceived reality that the father might persecute him. Um, there's, there's all the these kind of conflicts taking place. So he called it the pleasure principle. The, 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 so in that case, the, the, the desire for sexual possession and expression. And there's a thing called the reality principle, as I termed previously, like you know, what's outside, you know, restriction placed by society or, or parents or, or religion, you know, counteracting that again, the idea of conflict. And within his first model of the human mind, as we talked about, that he developed at the end uh, of uh, 
the interpretation of dreams in 1900 was you know consciousness so conscious pre-conscious and unconscious and they're in conflict so the, the, the unconscious forces are trying to emerge into consciousness but there are functions within consciousness which are keeping it repressed or, or the conscious mind is repressing um, the drives that ought not be uh, expressed according to whatever the mind understands at that time but he the the longest lasting model is that one he revised so this model existed from 1900 up till 1920 then he revised that model which incorporated uh, the unconscious pre-conscious and consciousness was his structural model uh, in which he <coughs> identified three let's call it structures of the mind but they, 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 they primarily work as, as functions of the mind as well so he gave them three names so I'll have some water So Freud argued that the, the human psyche is structured into three parts, echoing the tripartite song of Plato, and he called them the id, the ego, and the superego. So he actually himself named it the I, the it, and the over I, but in the translations it's called ego, the id, and the superego. So the, the, the id, we'll do all that first, is the structure or the function, which is the cluster of drives, primarily unconscious, that push for immediate satisfaction. And it's governed by the pleasure principle, the, the, the need for, for immediate gratification. And again, from the id emerges the sex drive and, and the death drive. And um, it's essentially the driving force of all human behavior and personality. So it's like a chaotic powerhouse of conflict where all these drives and desires are pushing for expression and the, the driving force of human life for Freud. That's the id. But all of that is irrational and unconscious and can't all be expressed. So that's where the second structure, which he calls the ego, is he gives an analogy of, of the id being like a horse and the ego being like the, 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 the rider of the horse. So there's all this drive seeking expression, but the ego reins it in and keeps it in line with societal parental expectations so it manages a balance between that pleasure principle and that inner desire in life the unconscious sexual primarily wishes and the demands of the outer world which is the reality principle and that desire can be for food or anything so but the, the ego and the reality principle will be whether the person can actually eat that much or have access to food whereas the desire might be to you know again Freud uh, have sex with a mother or, or you know as many sexual partners but the reality principle in the outside world will determine whether or not the person can actually um, gratify that wish uh, so the ego is kind of like a managing force of that conflict and um, by the most effective way it does it is by taking that desire and repressing it again and the fact that it does that that Freud says that that's an unconscious process by the ego because to repress it has to be unconscious back into unconscious because it's no longer repressed and it's not unconscious anymore so that's a constant process of keeping those desires repressing never really know about it per se um, and there's a whole other set of defense mechanisms like repression that the uh, ego does and we'll go into that in the next slide um, and for Freud a function he said that he argued that there's a functioning ego that keeps a lot of those things in control in check that is a sign of a healthy mind and uh, when it, the ego breaks down is when you know mental illness emerges so he famously said that you know the purpose of psychoanalysis or the, the therapy at least is that where there was id there is now ego so make, making sure that the, the ego is functioning properly and the third structure, the superego, is basically the conscious, the conscience of the person and the law and the reality principle, essentially what the uh, the morality that's being passed on to the child, whatever that's uh, correctly or inc incorrectly understood. So, for instance, the child in that Oedipal uh, conflict 
the child's perception that the father might persecute them that it's a reality thing is the idea of the super ego. Um, uh, but also when, when, when you emerge as, as, as quote, quote, rational uh, people and, and you understand the restrictions that society and whether religion is present or parental or familial uh, uh, pressures exert on you, that enters your superego. So the emergence of the superego in that Oedipal conflict comes through the identification with the father. So when the child has accepted that he can't take on the mother, uh, he identifies with the father and takes on the father's uh, sense of morality and uh, sense of right and wrong and makes that into the superego. And the superego for Freud isn't necessarily a positive thing either. It can be very punishing. Uh, conflictual aspect of the self, which is basically uh, battering the ego. So the ego is getting battered from both sides by the id and the super ego, and like you know, trying to uh, control both aspects and then keep him saying, going to Freud. So again, the idea of the conflict theory coming in, so there's the raging conflicts between the, the super ego and the id taking place and the, and, the, and the ego trying to rein those in. So that was the structure he developed by, by the 1920s, and uh, pretty much that's, that's what stayed in was uh, popularized within psychoanalysis. And as I said, the ego trying to control the id and the superego, it did it in one way, it was repressing those uh, desires back into the unconscious, but also the, there are more defense mechanisms as well. So the ego experiences threats from unconscious ideas, which give rise to anxiety, and it survives by defending itself against these threats, like aggression. The way in which it does this is through use of defense mechanisms, which are themselves unconscious. And the function of the defense mechanisms is to keep unconscious ideas out of consciousness. So, again, to repeat myself, impression is one of them, but there's many, many other um, um, defense mechanisms that have been elaborated by Freud and later on by his daughter, Anna Freud, who developed that school of ego psychology. So, uh, projection is one of them where you, know, you take that anxiety and you basically throw it out there in someone else so that if you're experiencing anxiety uh, you can project it onto someone else so these terms might sound familiar to you, you know, the problem isn't me it's you right uh, splitting is that when something conflicts or is causing deep ambivalence in someone uh, unconsciously the mind splits it into good and bad aspects and then it can repress one or project the other and so on and so forth but then it can be able to deal with uh, the, the, the polar aspects of that conflict. Uh, sublimation, people might, um, a response to that anxiety might be to transfigure that libido and the sex drive and that impulse or that aggression into something else. So, for instance, say the death drive towards aggression, right? Uh, you can't go around shooting or killing people, or expressing that drive according to Freud. Um, so you sublimate it, transfigure it into something that's socially acceptable, like, you know, boxing or fighting or uh, something else. Or for Freud, art can be an a sublimation of the uh, uh, unexpressed libido. Right. So many other defense mechanisms, but those are some, some of the few that I identified. Uh, that, that's a central part of, of psychoanalytic theory and practice and through those seven concepts then then emerges and there's a lot more as well again I, I, I understand I have to kind of like you know, give, a, give a very truncated summary of Freud's life and ideas but the, I think those are generally the, the, the major themes then emerges a theory again and this theory emerged from his own introspection and case studies which we read at his own word um, through a very particular historical context of society in Vienna, very bourgeois, very uh, Victorian in its sexual practices, and we call the religion is receding, but people have all these desires which they don't know what to do with. So he, he interprets that and extracts from that a body of theory, which we discussed, and then applies that. And that's the next part of it, which is he applied this theory to other people firstly therapy so one of my favorite philosophers ran again on you know he wrote a he wrote a, an essay in, in one of his books the reign of quantity about psychoanalysis 
and he was like while well, all these kind of of ideas and as Freud said these ideas about the unconscious and the libido and the sex drive they're not new Freud did not invent them but again says that what makes Freud's approach particularly demonic and satanic those are the ones he uses was that he made a practical application of those ideas so he reduced all human activity to the sexual um, and the libido and then applied it so it wasn't just some abstract thesis that was, you know, gathering dust somewhere. And likewise, you know, Marx developed his theory, but then it was applied in the form of communism. Uh, Darwin's theories, again, applications were great of all the sciences and so, and so forth. But Freud specifically, the applications of what made it sinister. So he had these desires and then universalized them and made that into a therapy of people who genuinely needed help and applied this idea of trying to understand all their conflicts based on repressed sexual desire or the uh, unreconciled beautiful conflicts within them. So that was therapy, which uh, really kicked off um, within Freud's lifetime, obviously, but ever since. And it's taken a bit of a hit, but as I said, the IPA, International Psychological Association, still boasts uh, 12,000 practicing analysts. And um, again, just, just the terminology that he, which, which he propagated and popularized in that period is now everyone speaks in those terms anyway so i think he fundamentally reconfigured uh the human mind and how they perceive themselves i mean even even from that developmental theory was the first theory of human personality and all personality research then emerged from that period so even our sense of self was very much determined or self-consciousness was determined by those early theories by Freud. so therapy and generally the human being beings understanding of their self and even as I said a psychology emerged much of it had, were responding to Freud so even if what they were doing were or the theories that emerged were still working within that language but as a reaction just take, changing their focus elsewhere whether that's relations or just human behavior so so forth but, but the ideas of the self and, and unconscious conflict that, that never really left a lot of, a lot of discourse after um, but that's about ther therapy and he then within his life as i said he began applying it to art and literature and that's continued ever since after Freud as well so people using psychoanalysis as a hermeneutic method of interpreting literature art so if you, if you study art and literature at university invariably you will study psychoanalytic psychoanalytic theory and use that as a lens to interpret this work or that you know, wrong with the Marxist interpretation, feminist interpretation, whatever. But Freud began that, and so he, he, he reviewed uh, Da Vinci's work and, and uh, came to his conclusions about sexuality through that. Uh, um, he looked back at Shakespeare and found what he wanted to find. So clearly Hamlet had a needable complex of Freud. Freud. Um, he then famously looked at the work of Dostoevsky in, in The Brothers Karamazov, absolutely too much of a spoiler where uh, the, the father is killed by one or several children of his so he, he saw that as uh, an expression and a proof for the Oedipal conflict as well he wrote an entire essay about those kinds of uh, in fact I think he declared it as his as the most magnificent novel of all time but that probably has something to do with his own bias and that you know um, confirmation bias about his theory and then the philosophical applications again i said in that final 15 not the final two decades of his life when his theory was consolidated he began then turning his attention to group psychology society religion politics the origins of religion and so and so forth and that's that application that we are interested in in this endeavor and that now that you do understand uh, with conover's theory we can then next session unpack how he applied that to his understanding of society and religion and because uh, if i went in straight into that into those works the, be, i'd have to go back into one or two anyway so here's some context about the man his own influences his life his ideas and then next time i think we'll be better prepared to really comfortably discuss those ideas about religion that he wrote in that final period of his life when his theory was consolidated. So just some recommended reading. Um, these are the works primarily that we'll be interested in. Um, so in that, his three heresies that he wrote about in that final period of his life, there's a 
The Future of an Illusion in 1927, Civilization and its Discontents in 1929, and Moses and Monotheism in the Final Work Before His Death, and that, then that work Totem and Taboo that was written in 1913. Um, the work on the right, uh, that, that book, Mass Psychology, contains two of those writings, so you can find The Future of an Illusion and Moses and Monotheism in there. Uh, you might have to acquire Totem and Taboo and Civilization and its Discontents separately. Uh, I think the, the most important perhaps of that work to read that we'll discuss mostly are the top two but but um, if, if, if you know torn for time i'd recommend you read future of an illusion and then civilization as discontent Moses and Montheism is a long work so i'll just try my best to summarize it as well as i can next week so next week we'll go over these works how we apply that theory that we discussed what factors played into it, uh, his own religiosity his own understanding of religion and then a major um, and then critical analysis of his, of his application and then his theory in general and, and how that works. And that will be the next lecture. And then we'll move on to Jung, Jung's ideas. So we'll do a similar process where I go over Jung's theories, lay down the groundwork, and talk about the psychology of religion. Um, so general reading, um, if, you're, if you're interested in reading about the history of psychoanalysis, there's an excellent book by George McCurry called Revolution in Mind, the creation of psychoanalysis. To, again, goes over all, all the ideas that are floating before Freud, how he applied them, the schools that emerged after him. Um, if you want a biography of Sigmund Freud's life and ideas, Peter Gay wrote a really good one in 1998 called Freud, Life for Our Time. And uh, Freud's own writings, uh, again, huge corpus of work. I think there's, I can't remember how many volumes there are, just complete works in English alone. But there's, there's a really good book by Jean-Michel uh, Kinodo uh, called uh, Reading Freud, a chronological exploration of Freud's writings. And um, it basically really well summarizes basically all of his works and uh, the main ideas in it uh, in one compact volume. Then, then based on that, you can choose to then read the individual works if you wish. But I would recommend reading some of the, some from the reading list that I mentioned on the previous slide. And for reasons of complete vanity, there's that. There's a sketch of Sigmund Freud on the right that I drew when I was 19. Uh, that's 10 years ago now. Uh, and I did not draw it out of reverence. It was just like, I think it was a, uh, a psychological society poster that I was designing for the people to join the society, hence Freud's hand pointing to you saying join the society. But uh, yeah. I think that will wrap it up for today. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope that wasn't too abrasive. I hope that wasn't too much either, but I tried to uh, uh, summarize the nice life in the book in one lecture. So hopefully all of us will be better, better equipped to deal with and discuss his ideas next session in two weeks' time, Sunday at 2 p.m. UK time. So inshallah, I'll see you all there. Thank you. Session again. Okay. So thank you very much, Lukman, for that uh, interesting session. And uh, let's move on to the question answers. I mean, you know, what I understand from this session, uh, this is primarily an overview of the biography and uh, works of uh, Freud at this moment. So, I mean, any questions that we can direct at it uh, would be, you know, of the nature of, you know, what is his personal life have to um do with his understanding of religion because you're saying that in the next lectures you will bring in further detail about the influence of uh, his ideas on on the understanding of religion as well so let me start off by asking a simple question here of the various things that you have described um in the first section your uh, uh, you know kind of description of his life and in the second um, a description of his ideas what do you think from his life uh, has been the most important uh, influence in driving his understanding of religion well i think his his understanding that all human expression emerges from sex and sexual conflict therefore he, he, based on his own experience, in his own life, he became convinced that because he had sexual attractions with his mother, therefore everyone would have it. Therefore, and if he places that at the center of all human activity, then anything that emerges from the human sphere, whether that's knowledge or art or music or religion, will be fundamentally driven by the libido. 
So that's the fundamental point of defining the Oedipus complex and talking about his history, saying that actually emerged from a very specific experience that he had and thoughts he had and what he interpreted that, that he placed at the center of human experience. And then as we'll see, he applies the Oedipal conflict in order to understand how human beings uh, uh, relate to uh, God or how, you know, well, he kind of, uh, it was, I don't want to give away too much perhaps before next week, is that the way he takes Feuerbach's idea of projection, but then fuses it with the Oedipal conflict and then tries to understand the relationship of man and God. So that's where his theory and his life become important, the way he becomes completely dogmatically uh, adamant that the Oedipal conflict is at the root, at the, at the center of all human activity. Um, and that's why so many of his followers left him during that period. So while he was still fleshing out his ideas of unconscious, everyone got on board with that Jung and Adler, and that's all fine. But when he keeps saying, he keeps looking at sex and absolutely everything he looks at, and saying that now I'm going to look at religion and society and politics and aggression in terms of this one thing, uh, that, that's when, when the split occurs. And that's when, when Jung actually then develops his own theory. So again, as a, as, a, as a response to Freud, but then looks at religion from a completely different perspective, showing that Freud had a very specific fixation with this idea of the Oedipal conflict. Uh, that's that's why I think that the kernel of his thought and theory in general, and then his applications. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> uh, well, not necessarily about uh, uh, not necessarily his uh, uh, fixation with the uh, Oedipal conflicts, uh, but his general uh, preoccupation with with sex in his in his understanding of all psychology uh you know is is well known and and has been criticized as well and there are alternate theories about it as well <clears throat> if i you know if i ask you to think about his life you know what I've, what you've read about uh, his life uh is there anything else do you think which relates specifically to religion and not let's say his general analysis of the society and and of the individual uh, is there anything else you think um, uh, from his biography that jumps out at, uh, at you uh, when he talks about religion? Is it just the edible complex or are there any other factors that you might have noticed? Well, he he has this very high estimation of himself as a genius. So it's kind of like an you know, hyper-rational creature who's understood the motives of human behavior. So religion is full of the of the comic book. You know, that he's standing somewhere up higher here and saying, oh, I actually understand why you do that thing. And he's always said that like you know look, lots of people like you know Nietzsche or even Jung all these people emerged being strongly religious themselves and then rebelled and then formed their ideas Freud expressly clearly says that I was always an atheist like he never believed in God he always had this indifference and 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 this apathy towards religion as something for irrational stupid folk and that's a lot of where his religious psychology comes in as well he's looking at like you know the common understanding of people uh, uh, you know um, chained by the irrational desires that he claims to understand. So I think his approach of emerging from a very specific 1800s, mid-1800s, atheistic, materialistic, uh, sci quote, quote, scientific approach determines his, at least his positionality. Even when he's responding about religion, there's writings that are recommended. He talks about, he is writing a letter to Romain Roland, which Roland talks about this oceanic feeling that arises from religion and says, I've never experienced anything like that, any kind of religious experience. So it's like, you know, someone who's never heard music trying to critique music, saying that, you know, this is, I don't need to tell you how skillful it is, and so forth, and the spiritual aspects of it, even though he was never engaged in it. Uh, in, 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 in a way that perhaps Nietzsche and Jung could talk about, because they were at some point in their lives religious. So that does, I think, impact the way he views it, his indifference and apathy of it, because he, he never experienced that kind of thing. And his family were largely quite secular. Uh, they did some, you know, cultural practices, from time to time, but it was, there was no any serious so religious engagement. He did look at Kabbalah, supposedly from an interpretative perspective, but then what I'm trying to say is that you know, he, there was this complete secularization for him, or, or you know, complete remove, removeness for him from, from religion, that then he tried to study as a scientist who would look at something like you know, something external under a microscope or whatever. So I think that that's a huge factor. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, from my point of view, there is a degree of hubris in there when uh, he looks at uh, religion and thinks that this is for, uh, well, whether he says that or not, uh, if that is your impression that he thinks that uh, this is for uh, ordinary folk and uh, he, from 
a much you know higher and much loftier perspective he can understand human psychology and why humans do what they do and and he un- understands better um you know why they believe in religion so there is a bit of hubris to it and i well his ideas have lived on but uh, it's it's not uh, it's not that that his ideas haven't been criticized or have been oh, no, no. Uh, we will challenged go by other theorists yeah yeah so I mean, primarily of them yeah. was Jung, and then we'll see how Jung did it. But he did it in his own weird way as well, in which he's more um, appreciative of religion, but purely on the psychological level of how that can serve certain functions in people's lives. So he understands that, sort of, to use a William James in terms of the pragmatic aspect of religion, that's like you know, a religion archetype that exists in people to create God. So he's less hostile to religion than Freud. I mean, Freud denied it, but he drew heavily from Schopenhauer and Nietzsche on, on these matters. He claimed he'd never read them until later in life, but there's, there's no way you can be in Germany when the German speaking world have not read them. There's lots of parallels between their thoughts on their hostilities. And then the most sympathetic of the three thinkers that we've discussed is then William James. So that actually, when you come to juxtapose these three thinkers, you can see three very different ways of appreciating the approach of religion, of which Freud is just right at the other end of the spectrum, of this, uh, trying to deconstruct the thing to basic uh, human sexual impulse. Uh, you also mentioned this word uh, science or scientific. I mean, uh, I've read and I've heard that his view or his understanding of what he was doing was that he was doing some sort of scientific analysis of uh, what uh, um, what human psychology is, or he thought that uh, he was doing science. But apparently, you know, later scientific developments have not accepted his views as such, right? If, you know, you know, from from twenty first century point of view, his views look more like uh, you know some sort of a philosophy to me. Oh yeah, but it's interesting though. Freud in, inadvertently created science because Freud sat there at the beginning of the nineteenth, uh, so twentieth century, saying, "No, no, no, this thing is a science." And the people like Karl Popper sat down and, to, in order to refute him and other kind of pseudosciences as equal, that then set down the laws for what science ought to be. And then Popper, then in that famous work, then. Lay down the rules saying that you know science ought to be for survival, kind of, you know, criticism hypothesis and so, and so forth, and be be uh, be able to uh, um, through through this, your same results in similar settings and so, and so forth. Then, so Freud actually, in 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 a way, formed science as a result of the uh, the, the counter tradition that emerged as a result. So, but but in the back, in his time, those those rules didn't really apply. He he said he was approaching things from a, from a physiological perspective, then found the psychological and then de- determined theory as you do in, in the physical sciences in the Kantian sense. And, you know, the Kantian approach, the Kantian approach to science is that you have, you know, uh, deductive uh, a priori assumptions, and then you inductively seek evidence for it. So according to that approach, according to that science, Freud then determined this uh, metapsychology, had some predetermined assumptions about the psyche, the structure of it, the primary drives, and then sort out inductive uh, results. So according to his time, in his time, he was probably right to call himself scientist. The idea of what science has then developed over the course of the 20th century, and now, obviously, retrospect- retrospectively, it's now considered pseudoscience from those critiques. And we will talk about the public critique next week as well. So, but then and again, like uh, you'd have to discredit all science prior to the pop <laughs> in some ways as well, or prior to the 20th century and for not for not living up to those standards and that's one primary critique presented by uh freudians in popper's critique is that the, the rules that he sets up relegates all science was aristotle doing science was newton really doing science yeah, was descartes doing science you know so yeah all right yeah thank you very much so uh i'll move on to kasim uh kasim uh, do you have any questions uh, Lukman, thank you very much once again, and uh, uh, Raza for organizing this. Um, I think uh, the, some of the questions that I asked, you have touched base uh, on, with, on those already, but um, maybe I, I just want to start with um, um, the scientific um, 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 in, um, uh, research carried out in the theories and the uh, and in the philosophies that he presented. Is there like any hard evidence? I mean, for uh, you know the the seven points that you mentioned, how where they sit, and if they are applicable or right in a particular 
condition or circumstances because it's possible that these seven, seven points uh, that you mentioned they are relevant and active in the early uh, you know 20th century uh, how the mind and ego was developing at that time the kind of relationships people had or what situation that freud went through but now um, you know it is not applicable and even in the beginning of 20th century part of india or other parts of uh, the world this these theories or these ideas would not be applicable so is there any research that uh, supports or, or either way you know any anything on that so most of that research would be then looking for the efficacy or the effectiveness of psychotherapy research uh, of psychotherapeutic practice so seeing that whether or not so this disorder exists uh, we apply psychotherapy psychoanalytic psychotherapy uh, and does the patient's symptoms decrease or according to the scale have they have the symptoms uh, improved um you can't do that with psychoanalysis because what i didn't talk about in the therapy was stuff with psychoanalysis uh it's typically like five sessions a week over five years so you can't really have a controlled experiment the way you do it with pharmacological research where you give them a pill and you double with placebo and then see whether a point a and point b within a very limited time frame there's improvements in either so it's very difficult to prove that so it's, it's mostly relies on anecdotal evidence there was one there is one ongoing major uh, randomized control trial, as they call it, of, of psychological research, which, which then would be able to show whether or not this particular therapy with its assumptions and approach yields better results. And it's a factor means that it's being applied effectively now. But we find that, that, that even in small controlled approaches where the whole psychoanalytic process is not taking place, there's a thing called the dodo bird effect, that, that all therapies virtually end up having the same kind of efficacy and effectiveness. The dodo bird effect coming from uh, Alice in Wonderland, where you know they're all they're all wet, and so they have a race around the lake to dry. And at the end, uh, the character asks, you know, who won the race? And then the dodo says, everyone won the race, and everyone wins prizes. So you know, all the therapies are basically simply effective because ultimately, what the patient and this is my my own interpretation, what the patient really wants is just to be heard. It doesn't matter about the the the, the what theory the the, the or what assumptions that the person. We live in such an age of loneliness that just by talking about their thing, the person gets you know, healed. So I, we, we, it's very difficult then to find out whether or not the specific theory works, especially now of all time. Freud didn't do mass, you know, randomized control trials. He just had like case studies. Again, we're taking him at his word that these things happen. He looked at his own memories and made interpretations and extrapolations and connections, which we might not even agree with, and he formed the basis of the theory. It's very, again, I, what I'm saying is that the, the, the ground was tenuous to begin with for the theory. Not that there's anything original in saying that, you know, the sex is a huge motivator. That's the idea of the Eros. It's a system time memorial. The reason why religion and all religions have, you know, prohibition of certain practices is because it's understood that those practices and engaging in certain aspects of yourself can, can have huge impacts on, you know, not just the family, but your own conduct and your own desire and how you control those and so on and so forth. But, but that's why I keep coming back to what made Freud's idea specifically Freudian was that kind of Oedipus complex. So how do you test that? Like, you know, <laughs> you know. So that's what Popper actually critiqued as well. That it's not falsifiable evidence. There's no way. It's kind of like a circular loop of evidence. Like you know, uh, Freud's experiences informed theory. Theory then informs the interpretation of, of the evidence there, and so and so forth. And it's just a cycle in itself. There's no way I can. Walk into uh, say India or you know the Sahara and collect data and be like okay yeah you know, this complex right here okay. Right. cool okay uh, the other one uh, obviously uh, by you already touched upon it as well is got to do with the rituals uh, I mean obviously in Islam you have rituals as well five times a day then you go yearly rituals monthly rituals and so on um, really if you think about it uh, if uh, the the mind is developed enough. Uh, from the beginning, uh, a child has grown up with good manners, you know, taught humanity, taught the fear of God and everything. Then in that case, how, how helpful are these uh, rituals in, in day-to-day -day life or going forward? Because when you go to the mind, uh, conscious mind or subconscious mind, all these, uh, everything that uh, the rituals are trying to uh, build uh, uh, build uh, is already there. So how 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 do you see? What is the importance of rituals going forward? I just 
uh, you know, obviously this is something that Freud uh, highlighted as well. No, so Freud viewed rituals as an expression of an obsession with neurosis because he saw that, you know, uh, neurotics would have like obsession with compulsions where they'd have to keep washing their hands or something, and therefore people repeating stuff that's just like, you know, some sort of source of repetition. But I think your question is more of a theological one of the purpose of prayer. And that's, that, that, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that question. That's not much of it's on psychology. I mean, I can have an opinion on the matter. My, my opinion is that, you know, I fundamentally don't believe in the self. I believe that there's just truly what is ontologically the self is just the fitra, which is a, an orientation towards the good and God and all the sources of, to use again, that Freudian term, I don't want to use it particularly, but, but all the drives that emerge from primarily from society or elsewhere and the conditions we grow up in and the conflicts that come from early childhood and throughout your life, they obviously uh, try to subvert or corrupt that pure impulse to its God. And through prayer and through ritual and through meaningful prayer and meaningful ritual is a purification of that orientation to its God. And I, the, I, I don't think that even no matter how well of a child that you have, you're going to go through adulthood and adulthood and, and life is suffering and pain and all that stuff and all sorts of influences and ideologies will come and try to corrupt that pureness and that pure orientation. So for me, I think, in my opinion, if I understand your question correctly, that's the purpose of ritual and, uh, and uh, religion. In its, in its purest essence of, of self-development and being less given notes. And, so. Again, that's, that's got nothing to do with psychology, in my opinion. That's just that uh, on the cross that has something to add to it. No, no, I, mean, I was just, I was listening to the conversation. Okay. Uh, this one. You're muted. This one more thing I would like to add. Um, you know, um, the question is about uh, when you need to talk about the rituals and stuff like that. So um, when you talk about the uh, rituals, I mean, um, the rituals that we find in different cultures, uh, different uh, religions, they, are, they originate uh, mainly from where the religion uh, originated from. Uh, I mean, if you look at the Hindus, you know, Islam, and, you know, they, they, they are very um, cultural, uh, you know, they are around cultures. Now, when the religion obviously goes out uh, of those uh, regions or areas, over there the cultural mm. and the mind is is a different uh, is a different mind that you're dealing with. Where this kind of uh, uh, practice may not be looked at, uh, you know, like okay. So in that case, because end of the day, uh, the message or you know whether it's humanity or worship of God or whatever is the same. How 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 um, uh, successful or practical is it for uh, to to change the local cultures for the uh, for the sake of religion, or is it just because that uh, uh, group of people were in power at that time, and hence they pushed through the ideas of uh, uh, you know rituals and practices into other cultures? That's interesting. But again, I, I don't see how that looks to psychology. So I, I, I will refrain from. Raza, do you have any thoughts on the matter? Whether or not uh, ritual can be transposed across space and time when it's just like a coherent. Like, it's like thinking, like, you know, look at modern secular religions, like, you know, football. Football for me is such an evident thing about, you know, like, you know, people deriving weekly meaning about their lives. They've got, got the chance, they've got the liturgy. They've got the clothes and the colors and the sense of meaning and belonging and the sense of enemy and the other and they've got an eschatological understanding of the season and how many uh, begins the cycles like the hindu <laughs> hindu hindu cycles as yeah. well every season and, and it's like thinking like okay if we see that as kind of like a pseudo religion and then try to impose that into pakistan and like you know people have to support everton or man united which they do for some bizarre reason i don't understand because it because football teams like kind of provided an asabiya to use the Ibn Khaldun term, in, in, for people, say, around Tottenham, in that area, they got behind their team and they kind of felt better than people who lived in Arsenal or Finsbury Park. But now it's fraud as that has values of Asabiya in Islamabad, where people in Pakistan are saying when, you know, Arsenal wins the cup, they're like, oh, we won the cup. 
they they wear their shirts and they acquire that whole pseudo religious aspect of it as well. So even even the outer forms of pseudo religion transposed across space and time can give people meaning in weird ways. Um, and I, I think that's what false religions can do. Now, now I, I imagine what you're saying is like you know if I went up to India in 2017, but like oh my god, you, you have to all sit down and watch the Arsenal's invincible season in 2004 and sing the same chants and all that stuff. That might be problematic, but I think that aspect which of me being of structure of a sense of belonging of, and then as i believe is islam that stuff and the essence of that belief is a temporal and universal across space and time but yeah with that hindu example i think the most closest analogy i can think of is football in that sense and, and other pseudo religions there's like so much but anyway, I, I don't know if that satisfies your answer. And that's got nothing to do with psychology. Again, I, I'm just giving my own uninformed, unpsychological, uneducated opinion on that matter. So, uh, I mean, uh, if I if I add something to uh, uh, what you said, I think you already covered one part of it, which is if you're talking about a ritual or um, the idea of uh, what a ritual is, well then you could say that it is universal because we could just uh, have a look at history and, and we see that people have been engaged in different rituals throughout uh, you know, time and space. So that tells you that the idea is a universal idea. It must have universal uh, underpinnings somewhere because of which we engage in uh, such things. You know, if you um, listen to podcasts and you listen to modern business leaders, they are now talking about rituals and they are writing books on, you know, business books on how good rituals are for your productivity and what are the morning rituals of, you know, ex-business leader. Why are they talking about this stuff, you know? Basically, they've just secularized the ideas that already existed and that they've transplanted them into the business world. And they, these ideas do have some universal or some cent you know some some sort of underpinning within our psychology our history our evolution and therefore we are able to you know repeat them in different contexts so the idea is universal if you're just talking about the form and the form is influenced by time and place and people now you could argue that uh, why doesn't the form change well yeah the form could change but for example if you look at well i'm going to literally take an example from martial art where the word form is used so they do forms or they do cutters or they do some sort of, uh, you know, or, you know, exercise as well, some sort of sequence of movements, which is a kind of a ritualistic, uh, uh, you know, set of um, uh, steps that they do. And they have been doing that for hundreds or even thousands of years, simply co because they have codified them. And that is how that practice is done. Right. So you you develop a practice and certain things become in their very form a part and expression of that um, that system and then it can be transported across time so even the form can hold uh, across centuries so if you are talking about universality of a concept then the, the universality exists on its own but then even if we are challenged the form of uh, or expression of that concept in a form that even that has you know evidently been you can you should you can show evidence that uh, it, it, it it exists uh, in different places, and it has been kept like that uh, throughout history. Yeah, thank you. Good, thanks. All right, cool. So that sounds like a, a nice note to end the conversation on. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Lukman for giving us a very hefty detail of uh, what Fried uh, was about, at least uh, what we've learned about him so far. And um, thank you for uh, thank you to Kasim for participating in uh, with his uh, interesting questions. So uh, let's th end the session here, and we look forward to what you bring further about uh, Freud in the next uh, uh, lectures. Thank you very much. I uh, know we had keep thank shipping the goalposts so the last few weeks and the time, so Kasim, I really appreciate it. No worries, bro. Stay patient. Thank you.